Nassim preacher, writing in Alexandria, this preacher is a late second century early Christian intellectual. In his day, he spoke of ritual objects in Egypt, quote, within everyone's purview. I think he's talking about here is Agathos Daimon. Agathos, for you Greek scholars, means good. But by the time you get to the founding of Alexandria, which as many of you know, Alexander the Great founded way back in around the 330s, when he conquered Egypt, he establishes the town of Alexandria, or rather the city, which becomes the great intellectual center of learning for the entire Greco-Roman period. And Agathos Daimon becomes the sort of, shall we say, mascot deity of Alexandria. He's before Serapis, and he is specifically associated with Alexandria. In Alexandria specifically, he takes on a snake or serpentine form. And in this form, he brings the grain and the fertility. A catacomb in Alexandria, Kom el Shukafa, and who do we find guarding the entrance of that Egyptian temple? Well, two images, one on either side of Agathos Daimon. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with M. David Litwa, who is the great sage. Everyone knows him by. <laughs> it's, it's like coming, coming a second nickname for you. Um, yeah. So listen, before we even get into what we're about to get into, this is going to be a juicy topic, as you saw in the intro. But the Patreon, guys, the Patreon, if you want to get initiated into the greatest of the greatest of the mysteries, you need to join the Patreon of M. David Litwa. Patreon.com slash M. David Litwa. I'm showing you the link right now. It's also linked in the description. It's also linked in the comments. You can't miss it. Click on it. There's different tiers. And uh, I'm telling you guys, this is this is knowledge that will put you on, it will give you that that edge over other people when it's hot when you're in these conversations, when we have these debates, you know. We have debates with dogmatists. We have debates with atheists. Whatever, whichever side you're on, you will have that edge because this is that knowledge. This is that gnosis that will, you know, that gives you the power, basically. So, yeah, I'm I'm a Patreon. That's where I get. Where do you think I get all this knowledge from? I get it from M. David Little. So, um, yeah, links in the description, and uh, yeah, enjoy. How you doing today? Great, Neil. Yeah, I mean. Obviously, I'm just trying to be a public scholar, do a service to the community, research with impact. So, yeah, I don't know what power you will gain, but I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I'm I'm working for you, and I'm I'm expanding the territory both now in the Patreon and now on a YouTube channel, and thanks to Neil. Uh, I'm quickly getting the word out. Um, I've got, I'm going to very soon finish the Found Christianities course. That's all going to be on YouTube for free. So everybody, uh, yeah, enjoy that. Check it out. Today, we'll be looking at the figure called Agathos Daimon. And what we'll be doing here is looking specifically at the Egyptian or Greco-Egyptian form of Agathos Daimon. There is just a pure Greek form, and then there is what happened in Alexandria. And that Alexandrian Agathos Daimon is what I'm going to be talking about here. So let's begin. I begin with 
actually my favorite uh, preacher of all, the Nassim preacher. And I think that this preacher was writing in Alexandria, and I'm going to tell you why. This preacher, whom I've dealt with before on this channel and on the Patreon, is a late second century early Christian intellectual. And in his day, he spoke of ritual objects in Egypt, quote, within everyone's purview. And the Greek here is aestena pantona pinosin, meaning that everybody knows the ritual objects that I'm talking about, because if you simply open your eyes and look around you, you can see what these are. And he doesn't tell you what these ritual objects are, but he goes on to say that these images stood in front of homes and that they are called good and bringers of good by the local population. So what I think he's talking about here is Agathos Daimon. Agathos, for you Greek scholars, means good, as some of you already know. Agatha Christie, she's literally the good. Um, but Agathos is the male form, and that means good. Daimon, as many of you know, means something like lower divinity. Sometimes it's translated spirit. So Agathos Daimon, sometimes you'll see these words combined as Agatha Daimon, literally means the good spirit or the good divinity. And he was associated with Agathy Tiki. Agathy Tiki is the feminine form, meaning good luck. Agathos Daimon is that god of good luck and of good fortune. And in Alexandria specifically, he takes on a snake or serpentine form. And in this form, he brings the grain and the fertility. So here is a specifically Alexandrian coin. And on this coin, you'll see that I've circled the ear of grain that is coming from beneath Agathos Daimon. Wow. Agathos Daimon is the bringer of grain, and he's wearing a little pharaonic cap. If you hmm. see, uh, he's got the double crown of Egypt on his head. I know that's a bit hard to see. And then on the left, uh, you have the caduceus, which is the wand, usually associated with Hermes, but also associated with Asclepius. It right. is healing. And so his two attributes are healing and grain or fertility. The LA on the bottom is not Los Angeles. That is the, <laughs> that is the Greek uh, number for 51. So this is year 51 of the Roman Empire. Oh, so, so we have a date on that. That's pretty good. So exactly. We can exactly date this year. This is early first century. So, and I is, that, some, is that 51 from Augustus's reign? Yes, beginning okay. from Augustus. Yes, because Augustus took over Egypt uh, around the year 30 BCE. So what's happening here is that you'll see these coins of Agathos Daimon, and I believe I'll have another one to show you, but these coins uh, of Agathos Daimon go up all the way until the third century CE, and they seem to peak right around the reign of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius. So during this first and second century, everybody knows and sees Agathos Daimon. He's everywhere, even on your coins. So keep that in mind. Agathos Daimon, according to Cornutus, has a specific attribute. Now, not everybody knows Cornutus, but you all should know Cornutus. Cornutus is first century CE Stoic who comes from North Africa and 
in Rome, he writes this fantastic book called Greek Theology. And you can get a very nice English translation from uh, Boy's Stones, and I highly recommend that. Uh, but when Cornutus comes to Agathus Daimon, he says specifically that Agathus Daimon has certain attributes. He is laden with fruits, and he defends and preserves household matters, and that his attribute is the horn of plenty, which uh, for Americans is probably most associated with the Thanksgiving right. um, horn of plenty, but this goes way back into the Greco-Roman period. The horn of plenty is sometimes also called the horn of Amalthea, and it's a very ancient symbol of fertility and abundance. Now, as I said, I'm talking specifically about the Egyptian form, or Greco-Egyptian form of Agathos Daimon. In Greece, prior to the founding of Alexandria, you also had Agathos Daimon, and Agathos Daimon, at the end of your banquets, you would pour a little libation to Agathos Daimon uh, of wine. And it's not clear whether prior to the Alexandrian variant, you had Agathos Daimon appearing in snake form. The jury is still out on that. There's just not a lot of evidence. But by the time you get to the founding of Alexandria, which as many of you know, Alexander the Great founded way back in around the 330s when he conquered Egypt, he establishes the town of Alexandria, or rather the city, which becomes the great intellectual center of learning for the entire Greco-Roman period. And Agathos Daimon becomes the sort of shall we say, mascot deity of Alexandria. He's before Serapis, and he is specifically associated with Alexandria. Wow. And we know about the, we know about a holiday in honor of Agathos Daimon from a text called the Alexander Romance. And although this text is probably written in the third century CE, it contains information about practices that were celebrated in Alexandria for many, many centuries earlier than that. And according to one of these holidays, we learn that on the 25th of Tibi, which is, I believe, uh, late January, the Alexandrians admit non-poisonous snakes into their houses. Hmm. They offer sacrifice to them, and they give them a taste of a grain dish, which was some sort of porridge. And these snakes were called agathy demonis, that is, symbols or sacraments of the civic deity Agathos Daimon. They were his representations and they brought good luck and fertility and good cheer to the household. And people would put up statues of Agathos Daimon in front of their house to protect the house. Sort of like you see, um, you know, people will sometimes put lions in front of their doorstep as a sort of protector. Um, the Alexandrians would put an uh, image of a stone snake. And if we turn back to the Nassim preacher, the Nassim preacher has an interesting theory, which sounds a little bit kooky today, but um, this is what he said. He said that the Greek word for temple, which is naos, came from the Hebrew word for snake, which is in transliterated Greek, naas, but from the Hebrew nachash. And that was his theory. And the question is, why would you think that? Uh, and we have to reconstruct from what he says, as is reported in the refutation of all heresies. 
And apparently, the Nasin preacher made this deduction because he looked around Alexandria or another city in Egypt, and he saw all of these snakes in front of temples. And the snakes were also associated with phallic imagery. So he was very interested in phallic imagery and in the snake in particular. And he saw it all around the temples. And so he made this association between the word for temple and the word for snake. It's pretty creative etymologizing, but um, obviously not many people accept that today. You know what's so crazy, Dr. Litwa, is that I was taking my Greek course earlier today with my Greek teacher, Dr. Amon, and we're reading this verse on the Ophites, which is serpent people in Greek. And I, I'm not kidding. I ask him, I go, is there a connection between the Nasins and the Ophites? And he was like, I don't know. You have to ask someone else that. And I was like, I'm probably going to ask that to Litwa tonight when I see him. Sure enough, before I even got to that question, you're already talking about the not scenes anyway. It's like, what? So what, is, I keep know? coming back to them. I keep okay. coming back to them. Yeah. Well, also, what I'm saying, are they connected to the old fights or no? Well, in my understanding, um, they obviously share some sort of name, but. Right. As we speak, I'm writing a book on the Nasins, yeah. and in the book, I hope to show that what we call Nasin theology is very different from Ophite theology. Oh. Ophite theology is mostly reconstructed from Irenaeus, yeah. but the Nasins have their own very distinctive theology, anthropology, as well as ritual practice. So in my view, we are dealing with two different groups. And that's why in the book Found Christianities, if any of your viewers have picked this up, I have chapters both on the Ophites and on the Nasins, in which I walk you through why they are different, actually different groups. Um, that's all I'll say about that at the moment. The other thing to keep in mind, however, is that the Nasins may not have called themselves Nasins. In fact, it's not very likely that they did. That was a, a name given to them by the author of the refutation. And uh, so in my view, they the snake was not actually very central to their thought and practice, despite the fact that they came up with this etymology uh, about naas and they knew about the hebrew word for snake snake is and snake imagery wasn't exactly central to what their program was but when i get that book published i'll let you know <laughs> um the other thing to know about agathus daimon is that he is sometimes morphed with Osiris. And we see that here where Isis on the left, you can recognize her by the crown. She has the horns and the sun um, crown. And she's also a different kind of snake. If you notice that her body is more like a cobra body. She is different than Agathus Daimon, um, who where has a beard and a crown, but because Isis is facing Agathos Diamond, we know also, also from the type of hat that what's really being said here is that Agathos Diamond is Osiris, and Osiris is Agathos Diamond, and they tended to morph, especially as we get later in Alexandrian history and we see that right here hmm. you, think um, you, know, why that, you think there's a reason why that alexander the great's birth is depicted in the romance from a serpent going into the room of olympia basically saying he's the son of this god or is this because i i get confused between amon and serapis are they the same are they so different like you know what i mean what it's interesting don't you think well 
several Greek gods can take the form of snakes, including okay. Zeus and Zeus Melekios can take a snake form. Uh, Amon Re takes a snake form, and that's the deity that impregnates Olympias, Alexander's mother. And so, yes, uh, Alexander is the son of Amon. But obviously, this imagery, this serpentine imagery, does mix in the minds of people. So, uh, snake gods and snake protectors, uh, they represent different gods, but it all very much can mix together in the mind of the devotees. So we're not sure how distinct people kept this material, but I'll show you one more image. Uh, Neil may be able to find more, but this is a, uh, I apologize, it's not entirely clear, but this is a catacomb in Alexandria wow. um, called Com El Shakafa, and there's someone was buried in here, but they made a very, very, very wonderful uh, set of carvings on the wall. And you can see that they essentially created the facade of a temple, of an Egyptian temple. And who do we find guarding the entrance of that Egyptian temple? Well, two images, one on either side of Agathos, Daimon, and you can tell because just as in the coins, he has the caduceus also sticking out behind him, plus the crown. So when the Nassim preacher said that this image was all over temples, most of these temples, as you can imagine, have been destroyed. And the only reason why this survives is because it was underground and wow. not found until modern times. So I'll just end by offering some suggestions for further reading. And honestly, there's not a ton of good literature on Agathos Daimon. Please don't trust everything you read on a Wikipedia entry. Um, go to the scholarship. And I can recommend for the specifically Alexandrian version of Agathos Daimon, a very classic work called Ptolemaic Alexandria. Just uh, two or three pages of that. Um, and recently, Daniel Ogden, um, his book Dracone, has a bit on Agathos Daimon. I give you the pages there. And Ogden also has a very nice kind of summarizing article on Alexander Agathos Daimon and Ptolemy in a book on foundation myths. So I don't want to leave you, you know, just with some sort of Wikipedia entry. I want to encourage all of you to go check out the scholarship and support me on the Patreon when I'm talking about this sort of thing, uh, because, you know, I, I can't write a book for free. Um, <laughs> I need somehow some way to support myself during this time. I will produce a book on the Nassins. I'm absolutely committed to it, in which I will talk more about this stuff. Um, and I thank everybody for supporting me, both on the Patreon and now on the YouTube channel. So I'll stop there. Wow. That's interesting. Um, let me just switch this over here okay so now how let me ask i'm trying to think how i want to put this there's a story about um the serapium being taken over by the christians in the fourth century i think it is late fourth century 395 yeah yeah late four okay so we're, we're almost fifth and um they they say in the inner innermost sanctuary are like i think serpents or phalluses maybe and uh, do you think this has something to do with the Agatha, Agatha Daemon being a serpent and connected with the, you know, phallic imagery? Or do well, I don't, I'm not sure what specific passage you're referring to, but yes, definitely. Um, Agatha's Daemon was definitely associated with the serpent and the phallus. 
And so there definitely would have been representations of Agatha's daimon, I think, pretty much all over the Serapium. Again, the Christians did such a good do job demolishing that. That is basically a worthless archaeological site today um, because everything was quite systematically demolished. Now, I say that, I um, mean, maybe we'll find something. But the other sad thing about Alexandria is there's been very little archaeology because it's still very much a modern city. And one has to really fight to get archaeological projects done well, because the general population doesn't seem to care very much about uh, some of the history and specifically some of the pre-Islamic history. Um, so we really are, we really need a team uh, to go into Alexandria. We need more people to visit Alexandria, put it on the map. It's just as important as visiting Greece or Rome. It's got, it, during its time, it had just as much cool stuff, uh, but now 90% uh, of it is just underneath everything else. So, <laughs> um, and I, I fully understand why, you know, people don't want their city upended, but occasionally uh, you can have uh, archeological digs even while the city is still going on. But, uh, and Rome is a good example of that. But um, yeah, now I've been talking so long, I've forgotten your question. Uh, oh yes, the Serapium. Um, yeah, definitely Agatha's diamond was there and uh, I'd, I'd love to find him again there, but uh, there's not much left, unfortunately. Now, this other deity named Tyke, if I'm pronouncing that right, Tiki, Tiki, yeah, Tiki, okay. She seems like to be um, a companion or some sort of uh, consort to this deity. Is there anything going on that reflects the mysteries with these two, with the horn of plenty and agricultural and fertility? Or, or, or what do you think about that? Well, it's a good question, but to be honest, there's not much mysterious about these deities. These deities are extremely common and mentioned okay. in everyday speech. In fact, in assemblies like, you know, the meeting of the Greek Senate, you would begin a decree by just mentioning the name of Agathi Tiki, which really? means we acknowledge the goddess of good luck. Wow. And here's what we're going to say. <laughs> so these are extremely common deities um, and seen everywhere. Uh, I mean, of course, snake imagery in general uh, finds a place in mystery cults, but usually that imagery is indicating other, other deities. Um, Remember that multiple Greek gods can appear in serpentine form. And is this is this a god that would be commonly used to, like, say, toast for or something like that? Like, is this like 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 you mentioned opening up a speech? Is this a not even outside of like those like everywhere basically? Is this always a common thing? Yeah, particularly common in banquets, as I mentioned, you would tip your cup to Agatha Stymon at the end of the meal as an expression of gratitude. So wow. he's he's very much um, involved in the sort of everyday religion of people, um, not just, you know, talked about by theologians. Everyone mentions him in daily household rituals. And his last question I have, is this God... Um synchronized with any other gods that you, that you know of? Well, we did see theocracy, which is God mixing with Osiris. Um, and uh, Osiris is also sometimes, um, or Serapis, I should say, is also sometimes viewed simply as a form of Osiris. Uh, because he's the combination of Osiris and Apis, so you get Serapis. Um, so I think certainly by the 2nd century, which is the period of the Nocene preacher, 
you definitely see a lot of mixing in the minds of these people. One thing I didn't mention, but which Daniel Ogden talks about, is um, Agatha Stymon seems also to be mixed with the Egyptian goddess Shai, um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And Shai is the Egyptian god of fate who appears in snake form. So I know all of this can get a little bit confusing, but that is uh, how people generally engaged with their, their deities. They were prepared to see multiple deities in the same form and multiple deities somehow polymorphic or, or mixed. Uh, and that was just how they, how they viewed it. Their spirituality was, looks much more like Hindu spirituality than it does uh, what we might think of as like certainly Islamic monotheism. Yeah. And now the, this, this, the imagery, is there any connection between this imagery of the snake with the lion head that we see as the demiurge? Yeah. Well, um, I'm that specifically is an image for Yalda Bayot. Yeah. And, um, I think we need to be careful there because when you when you put a lion head on a deity, uh, Yaldabaoth is definitely viewed negatively. And the thing to note about Agathos Daimon is he is always positive. Gotcha. And so that's a little bit hard for Christians to get their head around because they're so used to uh, associating snakes with evil and uh, the evil anti-divine powers but that is definitely not the case for ancient greeks who love to represent good gods as snakes i just found a wonderful carving or something i don't know where this is yeah that's agathos diamond yeah and then they're putting and up the coast see this host and it's underneath the lares, so this is a this is a Roman image, and so he's associated with the household. Those are the household gods. Wow, and this was from Manly P. Halls. Is this incorrect, or is this just an artistic? To, what do you think about something like this? That looks like modern art to me. Yeah. You, know, you got to be careful. Um, That's why I brought it up, just to make just so people can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Another good indication, don't believe everything on the internet. Um, get the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I always say if you're gonna you're gonna I like to do I'll look at Wikipedia for ideas. I'm not sure. gonna look on Wikipedia to, to just take in what it says. If I see something on Wikipedia, it's like, is that true? Then I dive deeper. I'll get I'll even email you or something. I go, hey, is this true? That's how I get a grasp. But I think Wikipedia is good just to see things, just to see ideas. But they're not always true. As, you, you, would you agree with that? Well, as much as you can, um, learn what are the basic scholarly encyclopedias. And right. I would say if you can start from the better sources, do so. But obviously, I know that, you know, Wikipedia is such a reflex. So easy. Um, that's fine uh as long as you're just using it as a springboard for further research sure yeah. well this has been fantastic and um yeah and oh but yeah before we go the youtube channel i already told you about the patreon the links in the description if you want to get initiated into the deeper mysteries if you want to learn more than the average cat that's where you go that's the patreon but if you can't afford anything you you start a youtube channel for free and it's got a bunch of content on there that's pretty darn good. And I, I had a link in the description. If you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know what you're doing. You're living under a rock. Subscribe. What is what's gonna happen? There's nothing can happen. It's the you you pay nothing and you get a lot of good content for free. So what do you, what can you lose? Hit that hold on a second. I'm gonna wait five. Hurry up, go and do it. I, I'm watching you. You're still you still haven't clicked it yet. You you yeah. I'm talking to you. Yep, you. Yes, go subscribe. Thank you. Okay, now we're good. 
Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Yep, and you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.